Hello, and thanks for joining me today. I want to lend my voice to the many voices that I heard today speaking up in Washington, D.C. and in Tallahassee and around the capital of Atlanta and many other places. There is trauma in the air and it's really important for people to be able to identify the symptoms of post-traumatic stress. I said in the description PTSD, but PTSD is a disorder and I'm not saying that everyone is disordered at this time, but we're all, well, in Yiddish, a little famished. We're, we're not quite ourselves and our brain is not quite itself either. And, and that's the important part is trauma lives in a different part of the brain. It takes our mental faculties offline, our prefrontal cortex, when we think, when we think we're thinking, we're using our, our gray matter, our cortex. And in order for that part of our brain to work, the other parts of our brain have to also be working. So one of the most important things that means is we have to feel safe. And right now, especially if you have any empathy, um, if you have been touched in any way, if, if you lost someone, if you've been involved in a shooting before, um, if you've got kids in school and you worry about them, if you are a kid in school and you worry about yourself, there's so many ways that you could be triggered. When you are empathic, empathetic, you also are resonating. The mirror neurons are going back and forth from other people. I, I talked last time about having your brain be regulated or dysregulated. And I said that by looking at somebody who is regulated, normally I am, and, and a, a person who is regulated can help other people through mirror neurons to be, to move up in their brain structure, to clear their mind. But right now, I don't know if I trust my brain structure. I have not been myself, I have to say. And so what I'm going to do is tell on myself. I want to... I want to say some of the things that have been happening to me because maybe if I say some of the ways that I haven't felt right, right in my mind, you know, just not right. Like I picked up a glass. Well, actually, my boyfriend brought me a glass that I drink my morning drink in every morning. And as I took it and looked at it, I said, I never saw this glass before. And it was the back of it. I'm used to seeing the front. But he said, it's the glass you drink from every day. And it just didn't look familiar. That's one of the symptoms of a kind of fogginess in the head where you see stuff that you see all the time. Uh, one way that I can talk about it is driving. You drive a route you have driven every day, and yet things look different. You feel like, wait a minute. Should I have made that turn already? Did I miss my my turn? Have I over? Have I have I already gone too far? Because what do we call that? Highway hypnosis, when you are driving from another part of your brain, you know the part that when you first learn to ride a bicycle, it's so hard you have to think of everything, or drive a stick shift, you have to think of everything. How do you clutch? When do you? Just, change how many miles an hour what's the rpm you know and then soon you're just whoo you know you're just doing it it's nothing it's a different part of the brain 
that, that does those activities. So when, when our brain isn't right, we're not right, we don't act like ourselves. So, okay, here's another thing that I did. Like, let's, let's call it a hair, hair, hairpin trigger. Is that what the word is? Hairpin trigger? Hair, I might have it a little, a little screwy, but something like that. Uh, you know, where you, you just snap. You, usually you can hold off and, and think rationally through things. Um, but it's kind of like, it's the last straw, you know, I can't take it anymore. Well, I, I had one of those the other day with my boyfriend and I want to talk about this because one time on my first live and second, I talked about something that he did. Um, and I called it gaslighting. I said that he made me feel like I didn't really feel when it had to do with, um, him breaking my new lipstick tube and breaking off the tip from it and, and then telling me it was okay. Okay, so I, I told on him. So this time I'm going to tell on me because I just did something that I'm not proud of and I don't have to share it, but I'm going to because that's who I am and that's what I do and I feel like that is how people learn. I'm not proud of it, but it happened. So, okay, you know those things that you tell your partner all the time and they don't quite get you. They just keep doing it wrong <laughs> they, you know you tell them how you like something and they they keep forgetting and they keep bringing it to you the wrong way so he brought me home uh, a meal some you know a little salad uh pasta and bread and he said he was gonna microwave it for me i said no 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 don't i'll do it myself because i definitely don't want the salad or the bread microwaved well next thing i know I have gone off to do something else. I've I've microwaved my um, my pasta. I've, I've eaten my salad. I think I'm eating it. And he brings over the two pieces of sourdough bread that he has wrapped up in a paper towel and microwaved for ten seconds. And I was no, he didn't even bring it over. It was right there, sitting at the at the table where I was eating. He was at the microwave when I noticed it, about 10 feet away, something like that. Um, it was a last straw kind of thing for me. And if my brain was right, maybe I would have just been able to say, hey, you know, I told you I didn't want a microwave. Now I can't eat it. This is, it's ruined it, you know, and maybe he would have gaslighted me again and told me, oh, it's not so bad, which he tried, you know, it's only been 10 seconds. But I was not in my right brain, not, not right versus left, right versus wrong. I was not in my correct brain and I had a very hairpin triggered and it, it caused me to, um, what would be the word, get violent? I don't know if I would call it violence per se, but erupt. And I'm holding the soggy bread in my hand and in my head it's going, you know, I've told you a million times I don't want my bread microwaved. And the next thing I know, and I swear this sounds like really ridiculous, the next thing I know, a piece of bread is in my hand and I'm throwing it. And then the other piece of bread is in my hand and I'm throwing that. It didn't make for a very good night. Um... I apologized. My bad. I know that. My fault. He did microwave my bread, but I threw something at him. I mean, yeah, two pieces of sourdough bread, you know, that were floppy from being microwaved and then, you know, didn't hurt him. But it was, I shouldn't have done it. It was not a good, nice thing to do. Not civilized. Um, and And that's... I'm going to say that's the kind of thing that might be happening to you when your brain isn't right. Um, I'm listening to these kids and one of them is just saying, nothing feels real. That's another way that you can put it when you're in post-traumatic stress. 
it's like a fugue state that you're walking through. Maybe like it's foggy or mucky, you know, and you're, you don't know if the ground is really underneath you as you're walking. You don't know how many steps you've taken. You, someone's talking to you and you, you don't know what they just said. You were in the middle of a sentence and you don't know what you were just saying. There are things that happen in the brain and body. Now, you know, a lot of people know some of the symptoms of PTSD, like those, you know, those triggers that sound like shots, something loud, like, you know, a loud noise can all of a sudden cause shock waves through the system. And you know the symptoms, a heart rate, sweaty, maybe you freeze, maybe you wanna run, maybe you do, maybe you get out of there, startle response. Now, another one is depression, feeling sad, crying. Maybe all of a sudden you're crying and you don't even know why, but you, you have this feeling of sadness come over you. It doesn't mean necessarily that you have depression. I'm not diagnosing anything. I'm saying this is a symptom, a sadness, a feeling of being depressed. But when I say depressed, you could almost call it like a depression, you know, something pressing down on you. And it it can literally make your body feel heavy, light, because you could be out of your body. You might bang into things because you're not really in your body. And so you might kick something and, you know, that can bring you back into your body. It can also hurt. You might not remember that you've turned the stove on and then find yourself burning something because you forgot you were in the middle. You might go to the refrigerator and go, what did I want? And then it might turn out, oh, it wasn't anything in the refrigerator at all. It was something in the cupboard. All of those ways that you can just dismiss you might not know anything's happening. I'm telling you, I want you to know that there is something happening because I have helped people to know that there's a reason. There's a reason for you to be feeling this way. And it's a, a trick of the brain. It's something that happens to save us. It, you know, it, it's just, this is what happens with trauma. We, we can't quite get back into our regular self. Memories, I mean, you know, you might forget something you said a minute before that you needed to remember. You know, remind me to do something. Oh, what was it that I just said I needed? Or, you know, you might be salting your food and go, wait a minute, I already put salt on there and you forgot already. So memories, and, and that's why trauma is so tricky because memories don't always get stored and retrieved the way that as we just go about our life, they go into a file, close the file, go into a file, you know, and they get stored. But when something traumatic happens, you never know where they're going to get stored in the, in the brain, I wanna say in the body because it might be that somebody touches you on the shoulder or the back or something and you start crying. Or you, you know, get startled or, because there's, there's things happening in the body too. You may have stomach aches, you may have back aches, headaches. You may hurt. Depression can hurt and sleep. I want to mention sleep because there's two things that I have noticed about sleep. And I, I speak a lot from my own experience of having had post-traumatic stress from various 
incidents, a flood, um, you know, losing a home, uh, car accidents. So breaking my arm, that was one of the worst. And then going for surgery. So all of these things can cause post-traumatic stress symptoms. But sleep is a really interesting one because what I felt was I was always tired. And you know when people are depressed how they may not want to get out of bed? Well, the weird thing about this kind of traumatic stress or depression is that you feel like you need to go to sleep because you're tired. And then you wake up and you're still tired and you look at the clock and you've slept 10 hours and you don't know why you're still tired and you go through the day and you're still tired and you can't figure it out. That's one of the symptoms. Getting the sleep that you need but never feeling rested. So I want you to, to realize that and, and maybe rest less sleep. Nightmares, nightmares. What do you think, you know, about all the soldiers returning home <clears throat> and all their nightmares? We know that that's a symptom of PTSD. We don't think of it for civilians, but having nightmares is actually a way that the brain has of processing these things until we can get to them because you do need to get to these memories to to cry um, to find friends to process with friends and social support is one of the best things that you can do for yourself is to not be alone and I'm thinking about the difference between, you know, what I have, what Nancy and I have been talking about mostly on this page and, and the lives. And by the way, Nancy will be doing one with me next week because we will be in March. It'll be the first weekend. Um, so we've been focusing a lot, you know, with Truth Telling Wins on the, the truth that people have been coming out with about having been abused and not believed whether it was um, sexual abuse from Dr. Larry Nassar or whether it was politicians that have had to step down, whether it was Hollywood, moguls, or, you know, all the different, whether it was as a child or as an adult. One of the differences that has happened to them compared to what happened with these kids, I'm going to go back to the, the school shooting, is that the ones that were abused were alone. It was done in secrecy. It was done by a person who may have threatened them, uh, told them that there would be consequences if they ever told and a lot of times they weren't believed. So these are some of the differences of what happened with these kids. Now think of the trauma. These are children going to school. They're, you know, they're in the middle of last period, I guess. School was just about getting out. They're getting ready to go home. It's another day like any other day. That day they had even had a fire drill and he pulls the fire alarm and they go, you know, their brain is like, we just had a fire drill, but they know what to do. It becomes a signal reaction. You have the signal and you have been trained to react. So that's where the guy got a lot of people out in the halls because they were reacting, they, you know, they were ready for the drill. But then when they found out this is real and they're hearing the rat-a-tat-tat, you know, the, the machine gun, I'm going to call it, going off, and the screams, and the soon they're hearing, they may be smelling the gunpowder, they're seeing 
fear in other people's eyes, right? And then as they're being taken out, finally safe, some of them, some of them not, some of them seeing people killed right in front of them, some of them being shot themselves. When they are being taken out, they're marching past desecrated bodies, pools of blood, scenes that nobody should see. And one thing that I heard one of the um, police chiefs, I think it was, or ER uh, head say is, my guys can't unsee what they saw today. And that's true. If you've ever had just like a breakup with a boyfriend or a girlfriend and, and you don't want to see them, their face again or hear their name again, because every time you do, it brings back the sadness. Imagine, you know, okay, and especially let's say if somebody cheated on you, and every time you see them, you now picture them in bed with someone, somebody else betraying you. Well, what about if every time you shut your eyes, you're seeing blood and you have the, the sights, the sounds, the smells, the feel of all of this going on through you, then you can't even get sleep, right? Because shutting your eyes becomes the trauma. The trauma is playing out on the back of your eyelids. You're, you're seeing it, you can't get away. So the kids that were there are going to be in trauma for a long time, but what do they have that is different? It was done where people saw it, there's witnesses, they're believed, and everybody is one. They're being held and loved and supported in this. So right now, and, and maybe for the rest of their life, if they were there, they may not get over this. But as far as the resilience of getting over it sooner, these kids will have that possibility of resiliency because they have people who are with them, who believe them, who know what they've gone through, and others to support them. And they're, they're in it together. Rape and sexual abuse happen in secrecy and you're alone, generally. So I wanted to just give that difference. I wanted to also go back to what I was talking about a week ago, which was that I was hoping that since the, you know, the majority white man in power over all of us, all over the world, but definitely here in America. Because you see it anywhere you go, you see it, the boardrooms, the congresses, they're, they're filled with mostly white men. I was saying, why can't the rest of us who are the majority stand up to them? And so I am so proud of these kids, 17 and under, who say, we're going to speak and we're never going to stop. You will not be able to shut us up. Yesterday, we were just kids in school. Today, and for the rest of our lives, we are activists. We have a message. We didn't ask to be put in this position, but now that we're here, we're going to make sure this stops. And these kids, can you believe they know nothing before Columbine? or 9-11-2001, they were born after 2001, or then. It, this is their life. We need to feel safe to fully thrive. And right now, people aren't keeping kids safe. We also need love, and that was a message that I brought up in last week's live when I was totally famished. I was in full blown trauma. I, I said at the beginning, I usually have, you know, thought about something to say. I have notes. I, you know, I've, I've got something in my head. My head was blank. There wasn't really anything there. 
But what came to me was basically those ideas of the rest of us have to stand up. I said 20% of the population was white men. I've looked it up, and they're they're trying to say 30%. I don't know. It still doesn't make sense to me. But there's still a majority of 70% who aren't. Um, and love. I kept mentioning love. What the world needs now is love. Well, there was a an op-ed or a letter to the editor or something in the in the Denver Post, I, I believe it was, and. Um, I heard him on the news, and he talked about that, I think it was called, I was almost a school shooter. His name was Aaron Stark, and he says that love saved him. He said two things. He said, first, the reason that he didn't do it was because he didn't have access to a gun. He's a man now. He's not a kid anymore, but he had it in his head that he wanted to kill someone or die. And the day, one of the days that he was planning to die to kill himself, he got a call from a friend and she invited him over. She said she had made a blueberry pie and was having a party. When he got there, it was in his honor. And the circle of friends shared a blueberry pie. And he said that love that she showed him at that moment saved his life. He is adamantly, totally, 100% sure that saved his life. So the idea of love is an important idea. But we have to have the wherewithal to even be able to accept love and give love. We have to feel safe enough. Our brains have to be organized enough that we're capable of it. But if we could get to that point, they say, what's the opposite of love? It's not hate, it's fear. Fear keeps us from loving. And the idea that, that they have to put more armed guards in school, and you're going to hear this a lot, you have to know that the sight of armed guards brings our primitive brain into fear. I was coming back from Holland, from Amsterdam, in 1990, January of 1990, and already, you know, Europe has been doing a lot more to protect people. Israel, you know, they say they have so many laws about getting a gun in Israel. It sounds like a good model. But when I was walking through the airport in Amsterdam to go home, for some reason I was flagged. I don't know. Unterman, German sounding name, I don't know. Um, but for some reason, they they flagged me. And there were machine, you know, rifles with bayonets, I guess, all over the place. And soldiers, like, lining the airport. I might have even looked. Maybe they flagged me because I looked scared. But I'm telling you, it was scary walking through there. And if you have to send a kid to school and you think it's going to make him feel safer because he sees someone standing guard, you know, like with, I'm trying to make a rifle, you know, holding a rifle, um, like a, a British guard, you know, standing there, that isn't what makes you feel safe. It's having somebody give you a hug. It's hard to hug someone with a concealed gun. It makes it a little lumpy for that hug. So I know they're going to bring it up as a solution, and it's probably going to be implemented. 
We're probably going to see more guns. Maybe they'll be concealed, maybe they won't. But guns beget guns. It Violence begets violence. And whenever we finally get to the idea of love, well, we'll probably all ascend. You know, life will be over. We got it. We're done. We don't have to be here anymore. <laughs> because, you know, that is, what are we here for? We're here to learn about love. That's what we're here for. So, okay. I only have a few things that I've uh, found to, to share this week. And one is the warning signs that a teenager could be a threat. So this is interesting because it's one, two, and three, but it's not if you have either one, two, or three. It's if you have all one, two, and three. Um, it's a cluster of behaviors. So a very violent history already that you are aggressive and um, severe. I, I can't even read my own my own writing. That, that can't mean severe. I, I don't know what I'm saying here. But um, by having a history of aggression and violence and have probably been reported to the principal's office, maybe some police run-ins, maybe domestic abuse. And I really want to mention domestic abuse right here because they have tried to make profiles of school shooters. No, shooters, shooters. I, I don't think it has to be a school. It could be, you know, like the guy in Las Vegas. Uh, shooters or the Pulse nightclub or Europe. And in their profiling, the only trait that I heard that they all had in common was a history of domestic violence. That's significant because here on Truth Telling Wins, we know that people don't even necessarily believe that someone has conducted fa uh, domestic violence, family violence. They still want proof. And sometimes when they get proof, they may not believe it because he's such a nice guy. How could he have done that? Well, I say we have to take that more seriously because if you have a bottom line, one thing that's at the bottom of everything, being cruel to your wife, your girlfriend, animals, children, domestic violence, history of domestic violence, that needs to be flagged. That is a signal. And what happens <laughs> with cops? They, they say, oh, it's a domestic dispute a lot of times. Or they get the guy out, he comes back home. You have to file a police report. You have to get it on the record. Because to have that on the record is going to lead to other things. He will have that record. He or she, right? I threw the bread. I don't think I'm doing domestic violence but my brain wasn't right. I don't think I make the list, but you know who would. You know if you've been hit or not. You know. We have to have that red flagged. That could lead to a school shooting, a mass shooting. I mean, that's huge. Okay, that's one. Threats to harm themselves or others. You have to take those seriously. And three, a trauma history, having been abused. So we are not giving a pass. We're not saying, oh, but you know, he was so bullied in school. But we do know that the kids that are bullied in school sometimes go back to get revenge. They could go postal. Those postal workers were probably bullied. They're is a good chance. So being bullied, losses, um, expulsion from schools or jobs, social isolation, lonely, like that guy that said I almost was a school shooter or having no friends. Those are all things to look at when they say if you see something, say something. 
here are some signs. So let's remember again, it's a cluster of these things. So the trauma history of being bullied, having no friends, being the school cootie, something like that. You know, nobody liked you. You go home, you're all alone. You're plotting in your mind. But threats to harm yourself or others. Add that to this cake and a violent history already. All of that, we have a possible explosive personality. And these are teenagers I'm talking about. These, this was signs that a teen could be a threat. Okay, so this is not every shooter. This is teen shooters while the bullying is still fresh. And, and we do have to watch for that. It's not nice to bully others. I found out that in Georgia, hate crimes don't exist, except in my county. Cobb County does report hate crimes, but Douglas County doesn't, Spalding County doesn't, and I can't remember the other ones. I just saw, I was, it was jaw dropping. I just saw the report yesterday. They don't report it because they don't believe in them because the state doesn't give a shit. Georgia is one of the states that has no hate crime law. And so the police don't want more red tape. And then they ask the ones in Cobb, how long does it take to call it a hate crime? Check a box. But you have to have the box to check. And because the state doesn't care, these other counties don't care. And so if they were bullied because of being of a different race, sexuality, religion, something, that's not going to be in there. And so that bullying that could have been from a cause doesn't get reported. So that's not going to go into the mix. So there is something that we can do. We can make, I think there's only three or five states that don't have hate crime laws. And Georgia is one of them. Thank you very much. I live here. <sighs> Thank you, Cobb County, for reporting it anyway. Okay, let's see. Um, this is something that's really exciting. The hashtag never again. These kids are not giving up. And so they've already got some dates that they're doing things. Uh, March 24th is the March for Our Lives. And March, and that's, I guess, a march on Washington, and there probably will be one in every city. And March 20th is the anniversary of Columbine. Um, the 20th? could be the 20th anniversary. And so that's a national school walkout. So expect your child to be home from school most likely on March. I mean, wait, that's April, April 20th. I think it's March 24th. Because what they said was, okay, you say it's too soon to talk about it. So we won't talk about it. We'll give you a month and then we'll talk about it. So I'm pretty sure that is March 24th and April 20th. So remember those dates. Remember the hashtag, never again. And let me see if there was anything else. Um, nope, I think that that was basically it for my notes about this subject. So take care of yourself. Know the symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Don't let it go to the disorder. Take care of it in the next three to six months, because if you don't, you will have PTSD. Thank you very much. Do something. Deal with the trauma. It lives in you. The body is a closed system. We need to let it out. So do nice things for your brain. The best thing you can do is to play and to have social support, do things that will keep you together. And I'm not talking just playing online. And I'll mention one other thing that I am freaked out about. 
did anyone else, and I can't even remember where I saw this, it just is mind-boggling. I think it was on CBS this morning, a few days ago, and they showed, a, maybe it was Sunday morning, maybe it was Sunday morning that CBS did. Um, they showed this gaming industry and this contest that they have for gamers where you can win like a million dollars or something and they fill stadiums, stadiums, like a hundred thousand people watching these guys compete to be the best at the game that they play, you know, and they might make it an Olympic sport. And I am so scared. I've already heard a report on NPR a few years ago, and I was hardly even paying attention because I'm a game inventor. I, I have invented a game called Clarity that you play on a table with other people because it's good for your brain to play. But I, I was listening when there was this report about women in the gaming industries and how they are not taken seriously. Game inventors, women who are game inventors. So I sat in my car, I, you know, you have those little driveway moments with NPR. I sat and I listened to it and I thought, oh, that's interesting. It didn't really affect me because I don't make online games, but that there is prejudice with women who invent games. It's a male industry is what I'm saying. And when I saw this stadium full of a hundred thousand people, I could not find a woman's face. This is scaring me because it's very male. It's very violent. Online games are showing, you know, killing, shooting, blowing up, robbing, uh, stealing cars, you know, just like I, I, I can't believe what they do. And I wonder what it's doing to the brain because you're seeing yourself shooting someone in a game. And how close does that make it to being able to pull a trigger and shoot someone? How much does that just objectify these people that you're making points by killing? And what is a world, a contest that only men join? What are we doing if we get all these guys on their own games, on their phones, their computers, with each other, and they create this world. Isn't it called World of Warfare? They're creating worlds that are very off balance. When I talk about balance, I mean between the masculine and the feminine. It's total masculine. If women play, they're, they're on their masculine side. You know, I'm not saying women can't play. Women aren't really invited here. This is like a boys club that I'm getting scared of. So I'll say it here first. I'm worried. I don't want it to be a, a sport at the Olympics and for people to get better and better and better at this because it's isolating. Those aren't your friends when you see their names and their scores and you're playing against them and you're making friends all over the world. Ooh, isn't this fun? I got so many friends. This isn't the way the brain was wired for human beings, and it scares me. So that's how I'll end, because I don't want to forget to talk about that. I hope next week when Nancy and I get together and, and talk, now that it seems that they fixed the Facebook Lives that you can do with other people, that we'll have something different to talk about. I don't know what it's going to be because these weeks, like one after another, is like, wee! It's just this ride of what is going to be next. And, you know, I mean, I was three hours before going on last week when this happened. So this, this is like a hold on to your seats kind of world right now. But I hope that you've enjoyed this. If you're watching now, if you're watching later, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Let's bring some sanity to the world. I would love to help you if you have a brain that's in trauma right now because this is what I've been working on. And I can say that I can snap out of it and get resilient and apologize and, you know, but it's not perfect. You just want to go back 
to being resilient and to being you again. And I've learned how to do it. I've worked on my shit a lot. I have cried. I have screamed. And I can help you to get that stuff out, to heal it, and to have your magical child self to walk through the world with. So please let me know if you need help. I'm here. I'd love to talk to you. Thanks a lot.